The Alltech Media Group, a full-service video production, advertising, and marketing company. For over three decades, we've been providing successful strategic ideas and media tools to small businesses, manufacturers, and government agencies. The Alltech Media Group is a one-source marketing solution, from videos and print to digital and social media for the manufacturing industry. Compare the difference in our customer service, the difference in our creativity, and the difference in our quality of work. For a free marketing evaluation, contact us today. Welcome again to this, our second Murrieta Candidate Forum this evening, brought to you by the Murrieta Wildemar Chamber of Commerce and Southwest Riverside County Association of Realtors. Prior to seating this evening, the candidates drew numbers for their seating arrangement. Each candidate will have two minutes for their opening statement. My name is Gene Wunderlich. I'll be your moderator again this evening and be asking the questions that have been submitted by audience members, by folks emailing the chamber, uh, and folks emailing me. Each candidate will have uh, one and a half minutes to answer the questions. Each candidate will have the same opportunity to answer the questions in the order of seating and then they'll have a minute and a half as well. <clears throat> and we start with number one, and then the second question will start with number two and rotate through that way. At the end of the questions, each candidate will then have one minute for a closing statement. <clears throat> Patrick Ellis will be our timer again this evening, seated in the front. He will signal when they have 30 seconds left, for when they have 10 seconds left, and when it's time to stop. Please be courteous to everyone's time. Don't go over your allotted time. Thank you again for your participation. We welcome the candidates, allowing the residents to get to know who you are, where you stand on the issues that are important to your community. Starting on my right. Ah, Mr. Ramos, thank you. Starting on my left, we have uh, Mayor Jonathan Ingram, incumbent running for District 1. In seat number two, Christy White running for District 2, Scott Vinton next to her running for District 5, Warren Konachek running for District 2, no, I'm sorry, District 5, Joshua Knight running for District 2, Ryan Haggerty for District 2, and Harry Ramos also for District 2. So uh, welcome to our candidates this evening, and thanks again for coming out. We're going to start with a series of questions that came off of your candidate statement, basically. So we'll, st we'll start with, ah, sorry about that. My bad, I'm already screwing up. I've only been here two minutes. We will start with Mr. Ingram for opening statements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wonderlock. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening. I appreciate it, especially it's 6 o'clock, and I know everybody wants to get home and have dinner, so I'll make it brief. Uh, my opponent uh, decided not to run, so I'm, I'm running unopposed at this point in the number one district, but I wanted to take the opportunity to afford you to ask me any questions that you might have, um, anything that I can answer this evening, I'd be more than glad to, even after the debate. Um, I hope that it's a productive evening this evening, and thank you for your time. Please excuse the attire, we're remodeling at my house. And so the, everything was dusted out, so it was either this or calm down, I'm the mayor t-shirt. So I figured the button down would be better. Good evening, thank you. I'm Christy White, I'm running for Murrieta City Council in District 2. And again, I <coughs> want to welcome everyone. It's a nice crowd, a nice turnout, and this is such a wonderful opportunity for us to earn your vote. I have currently served as a commissioner for the city of Murrieta for the last two and a half years, and I think that's really given me an idea of how city hall runs, how things work behind the scenes, how the council works together, and I'm very eager to earn your vote and anxious to hear the questions tonight during the next two hours, so thanks very much for coming. Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Vinton, and I'm running for... Uh, City Council in District 5. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the Chamber and Southwest County Riverside uh, or 
realtors, excuse me, uh, for putting this on. Thank you, Gene. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I think it's very important for everybody to be an informed voter. In fact, one of the things that we like to do before each election is we have a kind of a voter information night at our house, have friends come over to discuss all the propositions, what is important, how they feel about it, so we get everybody's input to know what they think, and then we all have a discussion about it, and we're all fully informed when we go to the, uh, when we go to the, the ballot box. Um, I am a former board member of the Temecula Valley Balloon and Wine Festival. I served for eight years, including three years as chairman of the board. Uh, so I have learned to work with a, a group of people and to be able to discuss and issues and not always agree and then be happy with the vote and if, we're, if it's something that I was not for, I'm always with the group as we went forward and made the decision because we made the decision a as a group. Uh, I would appreciate your vote and thank you all for being here. Hi, I'm Warren Konashek and I'm running as a writing candidate for District 5. Um, I'm in the real estate business. I'm hoping to apply my business experience to the city and I'm hoping to represent you guys. Um, I wanted to uh, thank SRCAR for hosting this forum. Um, as previously stated, my name is Josh Knight and I'm a candidate for the District 2 seat on the Marietta City Council. I'm running to preserve the quality of life for the people of Marietta. And I've been an attorney for 14 years and I, have, um, I believe that I would be a positive addition to the City Council. My wife and I moved here t 10 years ago when I got a job with the Riverside County Public Defender's Office. Currently I'm assigned to the Writs and Appeals Division where I assist the attorneys, our office, and the county to deal with uh, complex legal issues. And I hope to bring the same legal and problem solving skills to the city council. Uh, I, I have been interested in local issues since growing up in, in North County, San Diego, and have been a, um, a lifelong public, public servant with Santa Cruz, Kern, and Riverside counties. I have been applying with myriad commissions and attending city council meetings since 2010, and been giving back to the community as a youth soccer coach for the last four years. My legal background coupled with my love uh, for our community and desire to make Marietta um, a great place to live and work enables me to represent District 2 and Marietta, to listen to the views of the residents, to address the community concerns, and to provide solutions for the challenges that we face. It would be an honor and privilege to represent District 2 and Marietta, and I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Ryan Haggerty, and I'm running for City Council in District 2. Uh, I grew up in and around this community, so it holds a special place in my heart. I've owned and operated a business in Marietta for the last decade. During that time, I've been giving back to the community by hosting programs for the youth, supporting the arts, library, local sports, and other local businesses. Through my, innova my innovation and outside-the-box outside thinking, my business was rated the fastest-growing business of its kind in the state surpassing all competitors by leaps and bounds. I want to bring my innovation and problem solving abilities to city council and with your help, we can bring the city into the future. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Harry Ramos and I am running for city council district two. I first want to thank uh, the Chamber of Commerce and Southern Riverside County Association of Realtors for putting this together. I also want to thank uh, Mr. Wunderlich for keeping us in check. And I want to thank all the candidates for not only coming today, but for running. Community engagement is what makes cities great. A little about myself, I have lived in a district, uh, District 2, for over 10 years. I served in the Marine Corps for 11 years. Served as a Marietta City Councilman and Mayor. I have also been blessed to serve as Vice President for the NAACP Branch 1034, which we serve uh, 10 cities. I have also been on various other boards and committees to include vice president of my PTA, school site councils, and 
on boards on several uh, different veteran clubs. I truly believe to serve is the greatest honor, first to God, family, then country. <coughs> as far as my educational background, my field of study was business management with an emphasis in marketing. I have a minor in government. I have an associate's degree in hospitality management. Uh, I'm excited to get this evening started. So again, my name is Harry Ramos, and please consider me for your vote. Thank you all. This first round of questions came from looking at your candidate statement. Information was taken from there and submitted to us by a variety of folks. So we'll start with Jonathan Ingram. One of your campaign's strongest pledges four years ago was to expedite the development of the Dominigoni project, Murrieta's Golden Triangle. Yet among the many notable accomplishments on your candidate statement this year, there's no mention of this and the property remains empty. What's going on with the project and why has nothing been done? Well, you don't know whether anything's getting done or not, do you? That would be up to the council. The, the reality is there's a lot that's moved forward with the council. The ball has been in the Domenigoni family's court now for almost three years. A year to the date that I was sworn into office, the project was completed. It is a complicated development agreement, and we can have that conversation after this evening if you'd like. But there are things that are moving forward. Uh, brick and mortar stores have changed over the years. It was originally intended to be Rogersdale, then it was going to be the Temecula Mall. The vast majority of people in the audience go to Amazon to go shopping today. So the experience that the family is looking for is a way to provide jobs to the community, revenue to the city, and have a project that will benefit the city. It does no good to build a mall or another big box store that's going to sit empty. And that's what they're looking to achieve. I think the council is very supportive of looking and entertaining anything that can go in there because we know they could provide 6,000 plus jobs to our city. So again, we, we don't quite know yet. We'll find out and we'll be the first ones to let you know when we do. Thank you. <clears throat> Christy, your goals as extra extrapolated from your neighbors include safety and ex with excellent response times, a strong economic development plan to attract jobs and living within our budget. Yet the city appears to currently be exceeding its budget and you state that you will fight for more funding, specifically to improve roads and reduce traffic congestion. Will that fight come at the expense of other city priorities like parks and rec, public safety, additional personnel, or will it come from a fight to increase revenue through additional taxes and fees? Where will that fight for funding be focused? That's a great question, thank you. I think the funding will come from economic development uh, hopefully, we will be able to raise revenues through increased commercial <coughs> industrial types of businesses that will add more jobs to our, our city and to our coffers. I, we're already at staffing levels that are as low as they were when the Great re um, Recession hit us. We have not staffed up generally, so I would hope that we would not be able, not need to cut revenues or just salaries, and that would not be our, we would not ride <coughs> on the backs of trimming budget in terms of staffing in order to cut costs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vinton, in your statement, you cite your top priorities as public safety, fiscal responsibility, local jobs, responsible development, and parks and open space. Seems like you've addressed most of the issues facing the city today with the possible exception of traffic and homelessness. But that is a lot of top priorities. We know as a city councilor that you'll need to render decisions on a vast array of issues, but are there any one or two of these that might actually be your preeminent top priorities? Thank you, Gene. Yes, I think the top priority right now for the city is the fiscal health of the city. Uh, we operate right now under an $89 million budget that we have to uh, make sure we provide, continue to provide the uh, services, specifically uh, public safety, uh, we're actually about the, s the lowest amount of officers per residence for, in California for cities over 100,000 people. So how do we find a way to fund that? One is possibility is Measure T. I uh, have not made up my mind on that. Uh, I think that would be an opportunity, though, for us to uh, definitely help out the the city, um, but right now, I believe the fiscal response or the fiscal health of the city is most mostly important. 
Thank you. Mr. Kondacek, <clears throat> you've not filed a candidate statement, so we don't have the opportunity to dissect your words or gain any specific insight into your motivation. So in a more general sense, there have been months, if not years, in which to prepare for a run and build a resume to convince voters of your qualifications. Why should they bother to write you in now as a Johnny come lately to the table? I think they should write me in because um, I have new ideas, a fresh perspective of what we could do to our city to make it even better than it is right now. I, I've been in the real estate business for a long time and I've been really successful in the real estate business and I feel like I could apply my uh, business success to the city to make it even better than it is right now. Thank you. Mr. Knight. You have established an impressive legal career, you may rightly be proud of that. And you state that your legal background along with your love for the community makes you an ideal candidate. First I'll note that the majority of our congressmen also have legal backgrounds and that's not necessarily an asset <clears throat> as we've sadly seen the last uh, few days. Number two, the city has already contracted legal representation so might there be times when you would disagree with legal counsel. So I guess the question is, why is that an asset in your case? Well, I think it's an asset because in, in many cases, which I'm dealing with in either in court or in the office, I am tasked with really assessing a problem. And in speaking with the this, this city attorney as well, I would be coming from a perspective where I could actually ask about further topics that they may um, not be thinking about themselves. And so with the legal background and both, I while I work mainly in, in criminal law, I have also um, I also dabble in civil um, on the appellate level, and uh, which, which is civil in nature. And I've also had a general background from law school. I, while I understand that people sometimes resent lawyers, and I'm not going to ignore that reality in, in my business, and in, in, in the reason why I became a public defender and, and became a public servant and a, uh, was because we are collaboratively working. We can work together while being civil, in, even, even if we disagree, we can, we can come to a solution and, um, which, is, which sometimes is in the best interest of everyone and, and sometimes um, is not necessarily. However, the, the, um, I think that this, this background of high pressure situations has prepared me for dealing with the public in, um, with um, hot topics um, that come up. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Haggerty, your contribution of books to the community is indeed commendable, as are your efforts to expand literacy and the arts in the city. But how does that prepare you to address the broader and more serious issues facing our community today? Well, I have been running my business successfully for the last 10 years. I come from a background where my parents run a marketing and advertising company that deals with Ralston, Ralston Food for Less. They do all the marketing advertising for the entire West Coast. So I'm very familiar with big business. I'm very familiar with negotiating. I'm very familiar with what it takes to get the word out to people so voters can have good information. Um, I've been noticing a lot that a lot of people are misinformed in the city. And um, that starts with us, you know, giving information out. Uh, right now, my business is I have to sell things to people that they don't need and that's very difficult. And so I've had to be very creative in coming up, with the, coming up with different ways. I've started multiple Kickstarters that have all been successful um, for different projects. I had to work with other people and all the times we didn't agree, all, agree and we still got there and we were just successful. So I feel like any, anything that's thrown in front of us, we can work together and I have the skill set to work with um, you know, everyone. <laughs> Uh, it's a melting pot of people here, and uh, I just feel like I'm qualified um, for those reasons. Thank you. Mr. Ramos, you note in your candidate statement you're a justifiably proud veteran, and we applaud you for your service. However, you also state that you joined the military after 9-11, yet served in Desert Storm and Desert Shield, events that occurred a decade before 9-11. This has prompted some in our community to raise the issue of stolen valor. Can you explain this discrepancy? Thank you. Absolutely. It was a mistake. Um, I addressed this over a month ago. I had contacted uh, many <coughs> veteran organizations 
alerting them that I tried to correct the record, but as many candidates and electeds know that uh, once you fire that round, you cannot undo it even if it appears to be misleading. Um, again, I, I put this out on my website over a month ago, and on this stage, I do want to make it clear it was simply a mistake by one of my volunteers. Uh, we were re-editing uh, different statements at the last minute, kind of mushed things together, and uh, it was a, like I said, a, a mistake. Um, Clearly, it was not an attempt to mislead. I highlighted that I joined after 9-11. If I was trying to deceive, I would have said I joined in 1991. Um, I am truly sorry to any of the veterans or constituents who uh, are misled in any way. It truly was a last-minute error and something that I am embarrassed about. Um, so. Thank you. Next round of questions, we'll start with Christy White. The City Council has placed Measure T on the ballot that proposes to raise sales tax by 1% in the city, a measure estimated to bring an additional $14 million to the city every year. Two years ago, when Temecula, Hemet, Menifee, and others placed this successfully on their ballot, I specifically asked this question of the candidates then. All vehemently denied any interest in doing it, claimed it was not needed. What has changed during the past couple years, and in your opinion, is this measure needed, and do you support it? First, I think the City Council did the right thing by unanimously putting it on the ballot for the citizens of Murrieta to decide. I will go on the record as saying I do support it. I think it is necessary. We've gone through our contingency funds and reserves over the last six, seven years that were in place to use for shoring up discrepancies and shortfalls in the budget. So I think we need it in order to build up our reserves and contingency funds. We also need it in order to maintain our quality of life and to support our fire fighters. We depend on our firefighters for their quick response times and in order to have the equipment and the training that they need, we definitely need, in my opinion, to pass Measure T. As I said in the last statement, uh, I have not made up my mind as of yet on Measure T. I think it's uh, very important to consider it. I can tell you I have never voted for a, for a tax measure before in my life. However, this time I am definitely considering it. After reviewing the, um, the budget and the CAFR for the last, last fiscal year, it is looking like uh, we may be depleting all of our reserve on the fire funds in the next three years, and so we do need more income. The way that we get that revenue, whether it's economic development, ideally, uh, the council's done a good job uh, getting CarMax in and a few of the um, Marriott and some of the other hotels in. That's helping a lot, but we need more. So I, I would say at this time, I am definitely considering it and likely to vote for Measure T uh, due to our issues with, with the budget. I'm in favor of Measure T. I think it's a wonderful that the voters of Marietta get to decide on the fate of Measure T. I'm normally against increasing our taxes, but um, the extra funding for Measure T will make Marietta safer, and that's why I support it. While I understand um, how difficult any new tax is, I think that we all should support Measure T um, because it will improve the quality of, of life in our community. Um, our reserves, um, we, we have been eating into our reserves for the, for the last couple of years and our staff, staffing levels are pre-Great Recession levels. And our, our police are, should be, we should have 20, 25 more police officers, and our fire department is, is heavily strained by the calls that they're getting. Measure T would enable the council and the city to make sure that the response times are kept where they are, and that our parks are kept up, and, and hopefully our roads are kept up as well. So I think I urge everyone to support Measure T. Thank you. I definitely, I definitely agree with Mr. Knight. Um, there's a few other things. Uh, 
One, we were already at 8.75 uh, previously for our sales tax. Um, that recently went away um, this last year. Uh, we'll just be going back to where we were. Uh, we'll be competitive with Temecula and Menifee. I mean, we, we are a growing city. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we treat it, treat it as such. Uh, it's, it's just something that we need, honestly. It's, it's, we need to do this now so we can look to the future and start investing into our infrastructure um, uh, because that's what we need. So I agree with Mr. Knight and, and Christy, and, <laughs> and I know Ingram's before it too, so, uh, so please vote for T. So I believe I'm probably the only one um, on this uh, dais that does not support Measure T categorically. Um, first, uh, because our reserves are depleting, that is not a indication that we need to raise sales tax. It's just highlighting a spending pattern. Um, I truly agree that we need to uh, compete with Temecula and Menifee but we do not need to compete with them by raising our taxes to match these two cities. Uh, that's the reason why businesses put on sales. If it's cheaper, people come and you shop. If we want to bring business to the city, that's one way of raising revenue. Uh, it was highlighted that the last two years we used contingency funds. That is absolutely accurate. Um, when I was in office, we did not vote to put that as part of a budget um, uh, solution to balance the budget. Um, so I strongly disagree with it. I think it's a priority and spending issue in Marietta. It is not a funding issue. If you, even if you look at Marietta's projections for revenue, outside of this next year, which is curiously less than what was projected for the recent years previously, it is still an up graph on revenue. And yet spending it's just not matching up. And you will hear today that many of the solutions that is going to be asked here, the solution is Measure T. Okay, most that know me know that I'm philosophically against tax. Measure T was put on the, the ballot by the council to allow the people of Marietta to make a decision on this tax and the level of service that you would need. We are not deficit spending. Had it not been for council members finding money during the recession from projects that we had that they've developed for less, we would not have set 12 million aside in contingency funding that's been funded. We are funded through a fire district for our fire district who's been, we've been deficit spending for a long time and that district needs to help be supplemented through Measure T funding as one of the means. That means multiple means. Measure T is a band-aid, it's going to help but it's not the only thing the city's got planned. Um, we have 98 officers. The state standard is a thou it's one officer per thousand. Yes, we're short. Yes, we are down 60 employees in the city from 368. I believe the council's done a great job and the city manager in going back and looking at funding and what we're going to do. Measure T will be something that will help be, be proactive so we don't have to be reactive, so that we aren't having huge deficit spending. This is over the next two years. So I, I think that there's a lot of misnomers out there about Measure T, and uh, I, I, at this point, we have to support it. We have no choice. Thank you. Next question. We'll start with Mr. Vinton. Murrieta is currently dealing with an issue on the west side involving water service and the city's ability to effectively expand their commercial tax base. What's your take on this issue and what should the city do to resolve the matter? I'm not <clears throat> completely familiar with the issue other than I know uh, the water district that serves the west side is seriously <clears throat> underfunded and as an option, and I don't know if this has been discussed, so I, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit out of turn here, but we could go through a process where uh, one of the other water districts is able to uh, work with, uh, I'm not sure what the district is on the west side, but uh, work with them, whether it's Rancho or Eastern, to work with that district to take over uh, some of their uh, some of their 
constituents to be able to serve that side. Um, and that's a possibility. But again, as I said, I'm not that familiar with that specific issue. Um, the water district is seriously underfunded, so I think we need more funding to solve this issue. Um, this is a, you know, I'm a candidate for, for District 2, and I understand that this is a, a big issue for the western part of Marietta, and I've heard about the issues regarding the water district. However, when I've been um, going door to door and speaking to the voters about the issues, the water district for, for District 2 hasn't actually come up, so I can't give a, an educated answer to that issue. Thank you. Could you repeat the question? Yes. <clears throat> The city is currently dealing with an issue on the west side involving water service <clears throat> and the city's ability to effectively expand their commercial tax base. What's your take on the issue and what should the city do to resolve the matter? Well, I think first we should be looking at things at a case by case. Um, obviously, I'm with Mr. Knight and uh, uh, Scott here that, you know, it's, it's, it's an issue that's not, it's not big for us right now, uh, for our voters uh, in District 2. Um, I've been doing the same thing, going door to door. A lot of the issues that people have been talking about that I've been researching, um, it hasn't really been on the docket. So unfortunately, outside of that, I can't really give much. One of the big interesting things about Marietta is that we have four different water districts, so you can't have <coughs> continuity. If one person is developing and building in one area, the rules of the game is different if they're developing and building in another area. Plus, you got the costs associated with it. Uh, I'm strongly against, in almost every scenario, JPAs. But for the water districts in Marietta, I would be open into looking at a JPA where the four districts can come together so that we can have some consistency across the board. Um, I think Marietta uh, tries to do a good job in being the, the middle two uh, between the business and the water district. Um, but, but you need water, uh, um, and frankly speaking, uh, as much as we like to blame the water boards, uh, they really have virtually no power. Uh, the state mandates and brings down a lot of law laws on them, um, sets the standards, sets the rates on what they can do. Um, so, so the challenge is, is really goes, okay, 30 seconds. And so the challenge that really happens is, is working with uh, the environmental and the state water commissions and trying to um, conserve water when we're having the rainy years. So we need to start planning now ahead of time so that way we could be independent of it. But um, specific to, to that area, I, I really think that possibly a JPA might be a solution in Marietta so that we can have consistency in all the districts equally. Aging infrastructure, wells on the west end of town that are at 30 and 40 percent capacity. All water is purchased through the Met. There are four different suppliers. When it was divided up over the years, you had wholesalers, resellers. We have Eastern, we have Rancho, we have Western, and we have Elsinore Valley. They all use the same sewer treatment now because they do have a JPA. We have specific needs and issues that we're dealing with when we supplement well water into systems that we have today. Met water is $1,200 an acre foot. Well water is about 220. We have now submitted an application to LAFCO to look at who will best serve the interest of West Marietta. And it's essential that that problem is taken care of because it's impacting our economic development from an industrial standpoint. So the biggest problem that we're, we're dealing with is aging infrastructure. And you cannot bring development in if I cannot get a will serve letter to people that want to develop. That's the first thing. The next thing is figuring out how we can get that water and make it affordable. I cannot put the burden on one developer's back to pay the development impact fees and tell everybody, well, you're gonna pay for everybody else. So if I build a 100,000 square foot building, I can't spend $10 million on bringing three miles worth of pipes to one building. It's going to take a coalition of people, and we're working on that now. There is a committee that's actively working on it. 
We have a very unusual situation that doesn't always favor Murrieta by having four boutique water districts to argue and negotiate with. This is a big problem and it does uh, hinder the expansion of our commercial tax base. Um, I think that the LAFCO application will go a long way towards a possible solution and resolution so that we can expand on the west side and that negotiation will be led by staff and leaders um, as well as the city council. And the other point I would like to make is that even though this is a west side issue and not in district two, when I'm elected you'll never hear me say anything to the contrary about not representing all of Murrieta. I will be for um, special district two or district two as well as looking at what's in favor and what is for the benefit of Murrieta as a city as a whole. Thank you. Next question will start with Mr. Konishak. Do you think Murrieta should have capitulated in the fight over districting? And now that we've got it, do you think it will change the way you govern? For example, for a priority in your district over another. I think the districting um, was a, such a good idea for Marietta because it allows um, each part of Marietta to be better represented. And so I'll be taking care of my district if I get elected and I'll be focusing on the issues of Jisoo 5 and I'll be listening to what everyone needs for me to solve, solve all the issues we have in District 5. I think with districting, we need to understand that we are representatives, um, representing a district, but we're all citizens of Marietta. We all have the, the best interests of Marietta. With districting, it really gives a representative from a particular area to represent the interests of that area so that we don't have a cluster of representatives for Marietta and, and be it from, Marietta is not the only case, be it if you're from a liberal bastion like Santa Cruz, sometimes there can be a, um, a cluster of people from a particular area on the council and we want to make sure that, you know, when I'm running, I'm not running as, as just the District 2 candidate. Certainly District 2 elects me, but I'm going to represent all the best interests of Marietta. To under, but in order to have effective government, we want to make sure that all areas and all people feel like they have a representative on the council that they can go to, that they can, they can raise their concerns, and we can voice those concerns on the council. I, I am a big supporter of, of district elections. I understand that it was, it was forced on many cities, but I think... Um, so long as we, and I'm a, so long as we are like Christy or myself, where we are understanding that we are representing not only the district but the city, then, then our government will do fine. Thank you. Uh, my, my family's lived here for 20 years, and my brother graduated from Vista. My sister graduated from Marietta Valley. My younger brother and sister graduated from Marietta Mesa. Um, my, my business is on Madison Avenue. You know, I, I, I take pride of being a Marietta citizen, and obviously I am running for District 2, and a lot of the canvassing and campaigning has to be with District 2 because that's who's voting for us. So a lot of the issues that come up are, have been District 2 issues. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm repeating everyone else what they're saying right now, but it's the same thing. When I get in there, it's, it's more about what's the best for the city and not just for the districts. Um, I, I do not agree with, uh, you know, the districting. I think for Marietta in particular, we could have uh, gone without it. Uh, I know some cities that it's very applicable. I feel like for us, it's not. I am not in favor of districting. I think it's, uh, at, let me rephrase that. I'm not in favor of districting for the city of Marietta. Uh, certain larger scale cities uh, that may work. Uh, New York City, we have districting. LA has districting. That makes sense. Marietta is, is, is no reason to go districting. Uh, you saw an example of it today where uh, automatically a question was asked and the thought process is, well, this did not impact District 2. I did not even look into it. Um, it's not a knock on the candidates. It's just a mindset that will go into place with districting. Every two years, there will be civil wars. We can pretend like, well, you know, kumbaya right now, but when you're up for re-election, it really is gonna come down to what have you done lately for your district? And when people are voting for development, um, roads, who, who we try to prioritize based on the condition or when the slurry is needed, um, 
you, and you're voting on what's the best for the city, you're gonna really start focusing on what is best for my district. It's just human nature because you're trying to get reelected. So about every two years, you're gonna see a shift on the city council uh, on, on how projects are voted in and the placement of, of funds. And that's gonna be a problem for the city. It truly is gonna be a problem for the city. Plus, if you're focusing solely on your area, you're kind of in the dark on what's going on in the rest of the city. Um, so I strongly disagree, and, and I was glad when Jonathan did not vote for it. Thank you. You really want, you really want me to answer this one, huh? Yeah, absolutely. It was a parasite that came to the city. He robbed the city for $35,000 with a letter. He took our representation away from us, and he told us that we don't have the right to vote for all council members that set up here that may be elected that are on the dais now. So you get to vote for one member every four years. There is no equity in doing something like that. You want to talk about a Senate district or an Assembly district where I'm representing 500,000 people? That may work. But to sit here and listen to this whole district thing, it kind of played out to what I've said all along. If the west end of town has water issues and we don't resolve them as a council, it will impact the east end of town. Because the, gen the revenue is generated from a whole. And we need to think of our city as a whole. And I know the council members I've worked with over the last four years, we work together with every decision we've made to make sure that we take every constituent into consideration in Marietta. I, I represent the people that didn't vote for me as well as the people that did vote for me. And I've worked hard with my colleagues to make sure that we've done that. And I hope that will be the case. But when I hear second district, third district, fifth district, I represent Marietta and its people. And I don't like districts. And if I have my way, I'm gonna have it overturned. Ms. White. I don't believe so. Okay. I was thinking I already answered that question. Um, would you do me a favor and repeat the question? Certainly. Do you think Murrieta should have capitulated in the fight over districting? And now that we've got it, do you think it will change the way you govern, for example, for a priority in your district over another? <laughs> Thank you. I, I recall now why I think I answered that. It was very similar to my previous answer, that I will always represent all of Murrieta. I am elected as a city councilwoman to consider the picture, the whole picture, what's good for the east end, the west end, north and south of Murrieta. I think it still will be determined by the council that's elected how we're going to actually roll out an effective districting now that it's here. While I am opposed to it, I think we have an opportunity to really collaborate with each other on council as well as get input from the city citizens in each district and work out something that perhaps could be beneficial as we look at special needs in Mapleton or other areas in, in different districts and outlying areas. So I think we can make a positive out of a bad situation. On this one, I completely agree with Mr. Ingram. Uh, that gentleman came in just to make himself money. Did the city capitulate? Yes, unfortunately. However, I think it was the right thing to do because I don't think we could have afforded a lawsuit that uh, would have come forward with that. Having said that, I think what it does <coughs> offer is a unique opportunity for each council member to be able to hear specifics in a smaller group of people and from individuals on what might be important in that, their areas. Once that, you have that opportunity to talk to them and bring that forward, it still has to be a decision that is best, best for the city as a whole. I do not believe in segregating the districts and, and trying to vote for something that is uh, in the best interest of your own district at the expense of the city as a whole. We're elected as a council member for the city, not for a district. So, unfortunately, I was against that happening. It happened, we're here now, but I will govern if I'm elected as a city councilman, not a district. Thank you. 
Next question, we'll start this with uh, Mr. Knight. Cannabis has been an interesting topic the past couple of election cycles. A couple of years ago, none of the candidates admitted to ever having sampled the product and were adamant that cultivation, production, and dispensaries had no place in Murrieta. As cities around us are exploring revenue opportunities by allowing some uses within their cities, is this still a correct course for Murrieta and why? No matter what you think about marijuana, it is the law of the land. And, but it is important to remember, and as an attorney, um, I've worked within the laws um, for my in, in entire career. The citizens of Marietta, has, um, however, um, have a choice on whether this is something that they want in their community. I personally am against it. The problem then is that it is quasi-legal. It is legal on the state level and illegal on the federal level. And from my experience, in, um, from my legal experience, the problem is with these, with these businesses is that they are targets. And so until the, the federal government classifies them as something other than a Schedule One drug, then these businesses are going to be dealing in, largely in cash. They, can't put, they cannot put the money in banks because the banks would be complicit um, or it would be dealt with as, as money laundering on the federal level. And so I, until the federal government um, deals with it differently, we have, no, we have no business even looking into this. And even before, even, even beyond that, the law under Prop 64 allows the community to decide. And I don't think it fits our community values because it really is something that we don't want here, nor do we want the negative effects that come from it. Thank you. Marijuana is a Schedule One drug. It's, it's, um, it's one of those things that, as you were saying, that these, these places are targets. And it does bring people that aren't necessarily the greatest. Um, on the other side, there are some people that really need it. There are people that need it for medical reasons. Um, luckily, there's a lot of places that people can go that is not too far away. Are we losing out on some of those tax dollars? Of course we are. Uh, is there other ways we can go about it? Yes. But as of right now, if it's federally illegal, we, we just we shouldn't be looking into that. We have way more issues um, to go, go over and go through um, instead of worrying about whether or not that the place next, next door to my shop is going to get robbed. And if it does get come, ever come to Marietta, I think it should be highly regulated. I think it should have a lot of, there should be a lot of loopholes to jump through, a lot of licensing, a lot of checkups. I've seen a lot of, a lot of cities not do that, and it gets, it gets out of control. Um, so as of right now, I would not support it coming to Marietta. I too would not support it coming to Marietta. I do not think it, it, it matches our, our city uh, as a whole. Um, personally, I think, I think we were sold a line of goods. Uh, you just look at the papers, how many has marijuana crimes decreased? Uh, we just had a recent huge bust in, in, in Marietta. Um, the idea that it's going to lower crimes, it, it does not. Um, from when I was growing up, uh, we had uh, alcohol, we had liquor stores on every corner. Um, I can assure you that what would happen in, and not necessarily in Marietta, but in the state, uh, minority communities will be hit hard because they will have, uh, right in the liquor store, they will have uh, pot and liquor on every corner. Uh, I, I think it's despicable. Uh, I personally do not agree with it. Um, I do think there should be a distinction between marijuana use uh, for recreation and for medicinal. Uh, medicinal, I take a, a, a different approach. Uh, I do not believe that I should have the right uh, to tell somebody emphatically, if let's say you have cancer, that you should not be able to use it. I think that's a totally different subject. Uh, but for what was passed for the recreational use, I think that it would destroy our community. Um, so I, I do not support it at this time. Thank you. Well, if we're going to use it under the premise that most of the state is desperate for tax revenue and that's how they're going to generate it, you would probably all say yes, right? But it doesn't. And it is a gateway drug. And unless you put a brownie at the other side of that room for everybody to run to after they smoke it, it's not a productive drug to be on. I think the biggest problem that I see today is that 
the state of California has looked for so many ways to get revenue. This was just another thing to pass. The reality is with it, it, it will attract more issues. We're already having it delivered into our community. It's far more potent than anyone could ever fathom. It's unregulated. At what point do we go, if you want to use it for the premise that it's medical, put it in Rite Aid in a pharmacy. Don't put it in a commercial or an industrial park in a back alley where a bunch of people are coming in and out late at night. There's just too many things that, that this will impact that we need to look at. I was told when I was a kid, my mom used to say, go outside, get your suntan, here's baby oil and iodine. Today I go to the skin doctor every quarter to have a bunch of stuff cut off me. I have a magazine that said, 10 of the Surgeon Generals of this country said, unfiltered Lucky Strikes were this, the best cigarettes to smoke, they were the healthiest. We do not have enough research on what we're doing here, and I think it would be a mistake to have a knee-jerk reaction and allow that right now at this time. During the last year, talking about this with friends and neighbors and people that work in Murrieta, and recently in the last two months, while I've been door knocking and canvassing and speaking to people, I feel that the citizens of Murrieta are in agreement with the city council and the city council has continued to monitor and evaluate the cannabis proposition and cannabis related businesses in Murrieta. And I would support a very slow and measured approach to what the current council is doing in terms of um, monitoring it slowly and watching what other cities do and not letting it into Murrieta at this time. The first thing I'd like to say is that the federal government has no business having a law against it. It's not constitutional. Having said that, it should be at the state level. At the state level, uh, Prop 64 is bad law. It has let people out that should be still in jail. There's no good way to determine uh, driving while impaired. And and if we brought dispensaries in here to sell that, then we would have any tax gain we would get would be nullified by additional law enforcement needed to uh, maintain and watch out for those. So I am definitely against bringing in dispensaries here and against having it legalized. I think it was a great idea to legalize marijuana in California. I'm strongly in favor of Proposition 64. Some of the pros from the legalization of weed includes increased tax revenue. It has um, allowed courts and the police to concentrate on more violent crimes. It has dismantled the black market for marijuana. Uh, while I'm glad that Mar Maria is allowed to grow marijuana in their own homes, I want recreational and medical marijuana to be sold, manufactured, distributed, tested, and commercially grown here too. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Mr. Haggerty. People bandy about the term smart growth all the time. Oh, I'm for smart growth, I like smart growth, I am a smart growth. And my reply is usually, in the immortal words of Inigo Montoya and the Princess Bride, you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. What does smart growth mean to you? Smart growth means being responsible with how we're going to be building our infrastructure. For example, one of the things my platform is, um, is to bring ultra broadband to Marietta. Uh, there's ways to go about bringing high speed internet here that uh, can lower the prices for all the citizens and generate revenue for the city. Um, to me, that would be smart growth. So the term smart growth has been, I won't even say co-opted, it always meant um, walkable communities um, where you can walk from your house to your job. I hate to call it, say the term stack them and pack them, but having the apartments above the stores, um, that, that is the, the quote unquote term for smart growth is to be a all-contained area for your city. Uh, you see some of the little bits of it 
that's put into the state code that is mandated. Um, so for example, bike lanes, uh, that is a, a concept, part of smart growth, so that way you can bike to work. Um, if you look at every project, whether it's a park project, whether it's a highway um, project, if you actually listen to these boards, they will talk about smart growth and if we're going to build a road, well, we have to have areas where we can put housing right off the highway so people can walk and go right onto it. So that's what smart growth is. But I, I do like uh, the definition that was given previously. Um, we, we don't have to be afraid of that term. There is a way to build smartly. Um, to put into infrastructure beforehand. I actually worked on a, a similar concept and wanted to mandate that all new development had the, the, the couplings built underneath the street so that way when we was ready to go to ultra band that we could just put the wires right in. So I, I like that definition of smart growth better. I think it's a millennial term. Most of the time when I look when my kids are texting me, my grandkids I see, you know, OMG, all these other things, and you kind of go, the smart growth is simple. Smart growth is what the city implemented in historic Marietta where we have mixed retail. We have the ability to buy a condo, have an apartment, and have a coffee shop beneath you or dry cleaners. The new Old Town plan has paseos. There are many things that are happening there. Smart growth is having the income to protect what the city has built when you can no longer build out. We can maximize the ability of our city to have about 135,000 residents. You're seven times more likely to survive a heart attack than Marietta than anywhere in California. And that's because of council members prior to me, some of them sitting in this audience tonight, that helped that happen. Without the resources in the revenue, when we go into a maintenance phase, remember, when you hear development impact fees and you hear building fees, those are one-time fees. What happens when we can't develop anymore? We have to maintain our resources and keep our money local so that we can provide what we provide today a decade from now. That's smart growth. Smart growth in Murrieta is a good example of what is planned for the downtown uh, historic specific plan. I was lucky to be on some committees and participate in that. Another example of smart growth in Murrieta is the Adobe Springs project that is in the French Valley Airport area uh, off of Winchester and near Benton Road. That will have uh, a gated community with 263 homes, if I remember the number correctly. It also will have an incorporated into it facing Winchester, an industrial park that will spec out a thousand proposed new jobs. So when you're talking about uh, smart growth in Marietta, Adobe Springs is one of the examples of smart growth. And I think that uh, the infrastructure that's planned out in terms of traffic, water, sewer, and everything that went into the planning process and permitting of that job um, will serve us well, not only now in Marietta, but in the future. Smart growth is development that follows the guidelines of the general plan that, uh, in, in, that will allow um, excuse me, that will provide for the infrastructure that's needed, the circulation plan, uh, the land uses that are in there and used, and the circulation plan, such that we don't build more than what is uh, provided for in special plan because it went through, a, or general plan, because it went through an EIR process to be able to determine what the city can handle in each of its areas. And right now we still have areas avail available for development in the east side near where Christy was talking about, on the west side, and then some uh, smaller areas uh, along uh, Jackson and District 5. And so smart growth is following the general plan and providing projects that are go through the IR process as needed and, and will help build a better, better city. 
I think smart growth means better infrastructure and thriving businesses that improve the quality of life in Marietta. And that's what I'll work on if I'm elected in the 5th District. I view smart growth as, as really um, making sure that we, um, the, the growth that we have does not impact, um, negatively impact the citizens and also enhances the, the, the uh, citizens of Murrieta's um, lives. And I, I think that the, um, some of the, the previous um, developments that were, were named are, are some examples of that. I think that the, um, it, it's to make sure that we are planning with these, with these projects that the, the, the infrastructure is there for people to come in and out of the projects and that we're thinking about the secondary effects just like of, of I was thinking about the Costco project which is just across the street and making sure that we take into account that we um, put a barrier in between um, Clinton Keith so we're not encouraging um, students to try to go across the street to get food there. That's what I perceive as smart growth, growth is that um, enhancing our lives to allow us to be um, mobile, to walk, um, places to have parks, to have the, uh, the infrastructure that's going to enhance our lives. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Mr. Ramos. During the last forum, I, I believe you stated that the, uh, in, in response to a question on, on homelessness, that the regional homeless task force is a failure. I believe the term was epic failure. Could you expand on the reason why you believe that to be true? Do the rest of you agree or disagree? And what can or should Murrieta do different to address the increasing homeless population in our cities? I think this is a, a philosophical government question. Um, I truly do not believe that government can solve homelessness. Uh, even if we were to put in epic amount of money. Uh, you could take San Francisco, for example, and if you look at how much money they put into their homelessness, I think many of you will be astonished. And I don't know when's the last time and it was actually taking a trip to San Francisco. That too has been an epic failure. The truth of the matter is that this is a societal community issue and government needs to work on a regional level, but it needs to work with the churches, with the community, um, um, nonprofit organizations, uh, to try to solve problems for um, homelessness. Uh, we have to identify and realize that there are many different varying reasons why people are homeless. It's not just because they're uh, down on their luck. There are many who have mental health issues and we have to address uh, that problem as well. The reason why I say it's an epic failure is uh, numbers don't lie. The numbers of homeless has increased in the neighboring cities that are part of the uh, the regional efforts. Um, uh, simple, uh, simple man, if the numbers are going up and it's been uh, two plus years, that means that it failed. The regional task force has just gotten this. It's in its infancy. It's two years old. When I first got on council, we were doing about 350,000 pounds of food a year through our homeless efforts with St. Martha's and others. Today, we're doing almost 2.9 million pounds. We feed 500 families a week. This is a human issue. It is not a government issue. Sacramento and the federal government caused this by taking people that were ill and taking them out of medical facilities that they could not pay for and then put them in prisons. And when they created one, Proposition 109, 47, and all the other things they did, they took those people and they put them out on the street. Then you have children and veterans that are out there that I speak to every day that either self-medicate or have survival sex at 12 years old because that's how they survive because we as a society haven't stepped up to address the issues. And we need to. This is, our community has done a great job but this is a regional issue. And people go where they feel they're safe, and Marietta is a safe place to live. And we need to work on this as human beings first and not worry about the government level portion of it. If you're homeless and you're mentally ill, being homeless exacerbates it, trust me. And you can see it out there. We need to do something about this, but I don't believe that it's been a failure. It took 15 years to build Clinton Keith. Give us a little time to do the right thing and work it out. 
I agree. It's a problem that's come to the fore and only been in the works for the last two years. Temecula has a dedicated resource. We have Brian Ambrose, who's doing a phenomenal job coordinating with other municipalities locally um, on behalf of Murrieta. It is a regional problem. It is a city problem, and it has to be tackled on a regional level. Um, we're looking for the county to help with some funds, but obviously um, you can't really talk about homelessness without addressing affordable housing issues. And you also have to talk about veterans when you look at the total equation for homelessness. I think those are important elements. I was at a regional meeting just last Friday that was attended by 200 individuals and a number of categories of homelessness were um, identified. One area of focus immediately is those people who just need a temporary handout and a hand up. Um, those are people that, that's one third of the homeless population and how we can address that and solve that so that they don't become chronic homeless. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for educating churches to work together and coordinate their efforts in, in conjunction with what is needed as part of the solution. And I think that uh, Murrieta is leading the charge on fighting homelessness and being a solution. Homelessness is a regional problem. And I appreciate and, and thank the regional task force for the job that they're doing on it. Uh, also, as individuals, we need to do what we can. Uh, and I'm not talking about handing out money. That's not the way to do it. Um, however, uh, we did find a young man who was homeless. And we helped him find his family and got him connected with his family. Um, he was on uh, drugs and he got off the drugs and so that's uh, a good thing as, a, as individuals that we can do. Um, as far as the city goes, we need to work with the other cities regionally to, to help alleviate the problem. Homelessness is a real problem. We need to connect homeless people with the resources that they need. Measure T will help with this issue if it gets passed in November. It's a regional problem, but we can definitely solve this issue here in Marietta. I, I talked about this at the last forum, and I wanted to kind of clarify one of my comments, because um, people don't become homeless um, by choice, but some remain so by choice. And, and that's really the difficulty. And, and speaking with some of the Marietta PD officers, um, in asking about the, the individuals, the homeless population that we see, because there, there are two different homeless populations. There are in, individuals that are hard on their luck and sleeping in their cars, and there's a lot more people like that. And I, I agree with Christy, is that they, they need to, we need to work on making sure that we give them a hand up so they don't get into the point where they're chronically homeless. As for the chronically homeless, a population, the population is, is chronically um, affected by both mental illness and substance abuse. And that's where we, we need to be trying to connect them to services because they are also the most under users of Social Security and Medi-Cal. The veterans, I, I think, in, in speaking with um, Supervisor Washington, the veterans in Riverside County are um, really taken care of. However, the mentally ill, which is the individuals that, that we, we see most often, are not. And in its other cities, they have used um, they have used homeless task force where they have a mental they have a mental health professional. They have probation. They have an officer where they're trying to connect the individuals to resources. And I would I would fully support such efforts. Just one, one little plug. Prop 2 is actually for homeless, um, mentally ill people, and I, was, I would encourage everyone to support it. I spoke with uh, Brian Ambrose, uh, Marietta, his responsible care program. He uh, says he spends about 25% of his time uh, dealing with the homelessness, and he goes above and beyond. It's actually pretty amazing. He was telling me about driving people to where they need to go, you know, and not just one of those things that they're getting dropped off. It's you know, making sure they have a place to go, that there's a family member there, or they have a job set up. And uh, one thing that I noticed is that it, he's just one guy. And uh, with Measure T, uh, that can actually help the police department with dealing with these issues. A lot, 
you know, if we don't pass Measure T, we might have to start outsourcing our police department. We might have to go to sheriff's department. And if we do that, they're not gonna have the same relationship with the people out here. Um, you know, there's not very many, <laughs> uh, like, like everyone else is saying, there's not a lot of people that wanna be homeless. There are some people that have become complacent with it. You know, I was hearing a story about a, about a man that, you know, spends the weekend in Marietta in his tent, and then he goes back up to work in Marina Valley and stays in a, an apartment with a bunch of people up there. So he's actually coming to Marietta because it's safe and he doesn't feel like he's gonna be, you know, attacked in places like San Diego, Riverside. So it's a double-edged sword. We gotta be able to create relationships with these people and understand why they're here. And if we don't pass Measure T, we're, not, we're gonna have more issues with that. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, here's a, um, here's kind of a softball proposition question because I know Christy was looking forward to proposition questions. Uh, Prop 6 is about repealing the gas tax the state laid on us this year. As citizens, we were not granted the opportunity promised to us by Governor Brown, the opportunity to vote on a tax increase for the state. The downside, obviously, is the added cost to residents, to all commercial enterprises and businesses as well. It's resulted in an increase to the cost of anything transported, not just gas prices and registration fees, and it's certainly a burden to the 60 plus percent of our residents that climb on the freeway every morning. On the flip side, our transportation infrastructure is in disrepair. We need to dedicate significant resources to maintenance money, uh, and that's money the cities desperately need to meet their part of the obligation, monies that may only be available if the gas tax stays in place. So putting on your best city council and or resident hat, what's your recommendation on Prop 6, Mr. Ingram? Very deceptive ballots when you look at them. It says yes means is as saying no, you don't agree with Prop 6 or SB1. SB1 would have unilaterally, it was unilaterally forced upon people without making an option. Like with Measure T, Measure T is an option that's given to the people whether they choose to do it or not. I believe that if the governor had afforded the opportunity for people in the state to go, look, you don't want to be super commuters, you don't want us to build toll roads, Here's what we need to do. He didn't feel that he could get to a two-thirds majority, so he jammed it down everyone's throat. People don't like that. And it, it's come back to roost. The reality is, could that money have been used to help infrastructure? Yes. But I'm not going to hold my breath to find out. If what's going to happen is going to happen. I'm one vote on SB1 or Prop 6. Government needs to be transparent. They need to be targeted, and they need to say where the money's going. That would have probably changed what happened with SB1. Thank you for a question on ballot measure Proposition 6. I'm glad to have those tonight. Um, proposition 6 creates an additional step of voter approval with legislative passage and governor's signature required to impose, create, or extend to fuel taxes on or vehicle fee, uh, fees. Sorry, um, I attended the recent discussion uh, from the Southwest California Legislative Council and have studied the ballot measure as well on my own. The Legislative Council voted yes uh, in favor of repealing the tax, and I am in favor of that as well. As a civil engineer, this ballot measure hits me pretty close to home. Um, transportation projects, basically they feed, feed my family. And having said that, my company is pushing hard to make sure it's defeated. I am totally against Proposition 6. I don't vote for, with my own pocket. I vote for what I be, believe is right for the citizens of my city or my state or my country. And this gas tax that was passed, SB1, was just bad law again. The money doesn't all go to transportation projects. In fact, I would say less than 50% of the money is actually going to those projects. So I am definitely against our four prop six uh, in repealing the gas tax. 
I'm in favor of repealing the gas tax. The gas tax increases diesel tax by 4%, adds up to $175 more in vehicle registration fees, adds an additional 12 cents per gallon of gas and an additional 20 cents per gallon of diesel. Um, this is a tax that we do not need. While I understand the need for drastic improvement of our infrastructure, I do not believe the gas tax is the appropriate answer because it places too big of a burden on otherwise financially strapped families. And I agree um, with uh, many of the other answers. The transparency and the process is really the problem in how this was passed. And I think that if it was put to the voters, it would be a much, and if there was a guarantee that these funds would only be put toward infrastructure, it would be a much um, more difficult call. Yes is no. It's not a good thing. Um, I'm for something that is responsible. We are Marietta, we have a lot of uh, commuters, we have a lot of people that, a lot of military guys coming up from San Diego, going back and forth. This heavily impacts the people out here. And, you know, not everyone out here is, you know, making a million dollars a year that can afford, the, afford these things. So I think that, you know, definitely vote yes on this to repeal it. Um, uh, that's, and that's it. I think almost everybody's against a gas tax uh, is going to lose. Actually, it will, uh, Prop 1 will be overturned. Um, but I do want to highlight the hypocrisy and the answers respectfully to um, my contemporaries here. Uh, every reason that you can highlight why you want to vote no for uh, the gas tax, you can say the same thing for Measure T. Um, the only difference is, is that, well, we want the money here. Um, let's, let's, you know, forget the fact over the last two years we have a $15 million increase in revenues in the city, but, uh, you know, we're going to put the money to better use um, in our city. So, yes, you know, the poor veterans, um, which I, I want to categorically say um, the homelessness and veterans in Riverside County is horrific. They are not being serviced. Um, if you go to the March Air Force Base uh, homeless shelter, they closed down the women's facility due to lack of funds. So I, I just want to highlight that uh, veterans homelessness in Riverside County <coughs> is not being, the needs are not being met. But at any rate, you know, the poor veterans, you know, not everybody's millionaires. Um, it's the same thing for sales tax. Uh, taxes hurt the economy. And yes, we need new revenue. But if we lower our prices and we do a smart campaign and smart growth, we can attract more businesses and we can create more revenue with development within the city. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, I'll just, I'll just make a comment. I, I appreciate all your, your support for Proposition 6. I attended uh, Temecula's candidate forum last evening and they were uh, somewhat the opposite side of the table. So thank you all for, uh, for being in Murrieta. We like that. Um, it's for Ms. White. If you, if you like the last proposition question, you're going to love this one. Um, proposition 5 would allow residents over 55 or those with disabilities to transfer their Prop 13 tax base from any city in the state to any other city in the state. What do you see as the upsides and downsides of this proposition? And does Riverside County currently have a similar program in place? Yes, Riverside County has a 90% um, is has a program that's similar that's 90% in place. Um, in favor of it, it helps with housing shortage and gives incentives to people over 55 to go ahead and relocate and downsize, which actually opens up more affordable housing as they relocate. Um, I am in favor of the property tax transfer initiative for um, people 55 years old and older and those who are severely disabled. I think uh, the California Association of Realtors is supportive, um, as is the National Association of Realtors. Um, it's a general obligation bond, and I think that it will be a positive thing, and I hope the measure passes. I also am for Prop 5. Um, it definitely would benefit 
seniors purchasing new house, uh, whether they are downsizing, likely downsizing, uh, to relieve their, uh, their tax impact from buying a new house. I believe Prop 13 was a great thing for the state of California. And similarly, I believe this would help uh, those 55 and older to be able to afford to downsize and reduce their payments uh, on a house. I'm in favor of this proposition. It helps with the housing shortages. It's a positive thing. I really hope this measure passes. I, I support um, Prop 5's um, efforts in limiting the moving penalties for seniors and disabled um, individuals that seeks to change residences. As a personal, um, as a, as a personal story, my, my mother actually broke her leg and she was in a, a three-story condo and it made it very difficult for, for a um, close to 70-year-old woman to go upstairs after she w had been hobbled. And, um, and it certainly, um, um, while my folks were able to, to move, I don't know if everybody else would be able to, and um, because they were able to move to a one story, where is it, which is much more um, um, friendly to people that have movement issues. And so I, I, I think this is going to have a positive effect on our seniors and for the disabled population so that they won't pay the, uh, moving, the uh, penalty of moving if they want to find more accommodating, um, uh, find a more accommodating home. So I'm just going to use an example. It's not a self-interest thing, but I'm using an example. My dad just turned 55 this year, and we have a big family. We have a lot of kids in our family, and they have a big house where we could all grow up in, and we had a good time. But now it's just him and my mom, and they don't need that house anymore. My dad's getting older, having a little bit harder time with certain things. So to me, this makes sense. People should be able to use the same tax level assessment that they had when they bought their house originally um, in Marietta, and they shouldn't be, they should be able to stay here. Um, and I want my parents to be able to stay here, and I want to stay here, and when I grow old, I want to be able to do the same thing. So I'm definitely voting yes on this. I 100% support this prop. It's probably my second favorite behind uh, gas tax. Um, while building houses will fix the housing shortage in the state of California, this allows better use of the houses potentially on the market. So as was highlighted, if you have a huge family, a huge house, and now you're empty nest, have an empty nest, um, you're allowed to move to a smaller house and a, a new family coming up can now have an opportunity to get the house of their dreams that can fit and accommodate them. Um, yes, Riverside as a county uh, was one of the counties that allowed uh, um, um, individuals who lived outside of the county to move into the county. Um, one of the downsides, and this is minuscule, but just to answer the question, uh, I'm for local control. Um, I despised it when I was on the council when the state took away rights from the city council. Um, this bill does take away the right of the county to make that decision if they wanted to um, sort of opt in to, into that program. Again, the, the benefits way outweigh uh, the, the negative, but I just wanted to answer the question, and that's, that's one thing, losing some local control on the county level. No brainer. It's a good thing to vote for both ways. If I sell a property that I paid $200,000 for in the 60s, and it's worth $1 million, the tax base is gonna be between 1.25% and 2%. I'm giving a domicile to somebody that can afford to live in a home that suits their needs. I want to talk about Measure T and SB1 is what I want to talk about now since I got this out of the way. It is not the same. It is absolutely not the same. Measure T funding will stay in Marietta. It will be controlled by Marietta's residents and Marietta's duly elected council if it's passed. SB1 was not. And we wouldn't be entertaining things like Measure T had not our money been usurped over the last decade to the tune of $10 million a year. Thank you. You're still up. <clears throat> oh, no. Okay, I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> All right. That's right. 
Okay. Then we'll start this with Mr. Vinton. You realize you'll be subject to public excoriation, people calling you names from the lectern, residents feeling free to unload their grievances at the grocery store, the gas station, in the restroom. Their children may tease your children over a decision you made. Are you ready for that? I mean, there's a lot of good things and perks to the office as well, but let's be honest, even as great as you all are, you will not be universally popular. So how do you deal with that? That's a great question. Um, I realize that in the current climate, uh, we have got to a point where people are so emotional about people who are elected to office and I, I think it's gone totally against where we've started and where we should be. My, my parents had these great friends that were totally on the opposite end of the spectrum uh, when I was growing up and they'd sit down at the dinner table and have these great discussions and, and just back and forth and I'd sit there and I'd just listen to them because it was, it was fascinating. Um, so I, I'm really, it really hurts me that we're here, we can't uh, have, voice our opinions and, and be able to have civil discussions with each other about why we believe it. <coughs> Not to get anybody to disagree or to agree with you, but just to have the discussions and learn more. Having said that, um, I've got a thick skin. Uh, my wife, she might not like it as much. Uh, she tends to want to come defend me, but I have no issues with uh, people speaking their mind. I will be happy to sit and listen to them and hear what they have to say. I would hope that their issue discussed civilly and uh, even, if, but heartfelt. I'm ready to serve Marietta. I'm ready to serve District 5. Uh, I think we need to have more civil discussions on both sides of the issues and I think I could take it, any criticism. You know, I actually appreciate criticism because then I know what I could do to um, fix any issues that I didn't know about at the time. Um, my job is a little stressful sometimes. And um, I get calls from uh, attorneys, clients, DAs. Um, and I am faced with, with judges. And this is something that I'm, I'm accustomed to. I mean, this is something that when I'm, I deal with high pressure situations. And the, the best thing to do is to, we need to be, um, I think there's a maxim, or a, a quote is, is it be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And, and a lot of these things is that when we're in, and I understand the criticisms that I'm gonna, I would get if I'm on the council, and, and I, we don't have to um, agree with one another and, um, without, but not be civil with each other. I mean, we can, we can disagree and um, still be agreeable. And I know this is a lost art in, in our uh, current political climate. However, you know, I am, I am accustomed to these high, these, um, high stress situations and, and in dealing with the situations and trying to find positive solutions. Or at least hearing an ind a person out and getting their point of view because if, you, if we can get our, the, each other's point of view, then we can get to that point where we are understanding each other and getting to being able to disagree and still be agreeable. I've been, I've had my store since 2009 and I've been in the public for a long time. I've done a lot of public events. I've worked with a lot of people. And one thing I've learned is that people want to be heard. And people are also passionate, especially the people of Marietta. And when you have a Yelp, <laughs> you have to learn that when people say things that, you know, maybe something that you're doing isn't the greatest. And maybe they're not explaining it to you the best way. But what I've learned is to take criticism, understand it, pinpoint where I need to, to improve, where things need to improve, and attack those issues instead of dwelling on some of the noise. So I can really filter you know, what people are saying as far as when that criticism comes, and I feel like that's a very strong trait of mine. Well, 
Well, I, I agree with the comments that are stated here. When, when, you're, when you're elected, you realize uh, you have, I don't know, 116,000 plus bosses. Every issue um, is extremely, everyone has an extremely important issue. Um, I've been yelled at for chickens. I've been yelled at for um, supporting and trying to get a shooting range in Marietta. I was yelled at for um, supporting putting In God We Trust on the dais. Um, I'm being yelled at for my position on Measure T. Um, I, I think that the, the most important thing is to, to understand who you serve and it is well within someone's rights if they want to express their opinions. I think that you, in order to grow, you should listen because there's always, uh, at least it's their truth, even if it's patently false, 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 excuse me, it is those individuals' truth and you should listen and try to um, um, grow from it. Uh, I have always, uh, no matter who was speaking, anyone who has ever came up to me, um, I have always listened to what their concerns are, um, and I will continue to do as such. Uh, but I will say that, that this type of, of sentiment is what keeps good people from wanting to serve. The, there are so many blessings to be on the council, and you meet so many wonderful people that this element should, I truly hope, doesn't scare people off from trying to do this. <coughs> My mom used to tell me when I was a kid, nothing ever gets eaten as hot as it's cooked. It'll cool down before it gets to the table. If you're a critical thinker, there's nothing wrong with being critical with people, but you have to be critical with compassion. If there's anger there, then that's hostility. You might want to seek some counseling. The reality is people get angry and they get very passionate about what they do, but I've hung out with Gene Wonderlicht. Faye and Whitey Wands, I've taken my, my share of licks over the years and set and built friendships and relationships. And that's what being on the city council about. It's about building a coalition of people that work together to protect a community. Uh, my wife and I have been married 35 years because of my charming personality, I, I hope, but I know better because we disagree on a daily basis. What unites us is the ability to come to a good decision and what's best for our family. Marietta is a family, and we, the council works together to make sure that we make decisions that are important, whether people get angry or not. And a lot of times, you catch a lot of heat, <coughs> and you need to anticipate that coming in, and you need to be understanding, because again, if you're not compassionate to the persons, you're, you're not gonna be able to hear what they're saying, you're just gonna shut them down. As a city commissioner during the last two and a half years, I've dealt with a lot of individuals and I love the citizens of Marietta and their passion. Professionally, I'm really well qualified. I was a customer service manager and led a customer service team of 25 for a financial services company. And when you're talking about people's money, you really learn how to give good service. I always taught my team and led them to believe that the complaint is a gift and there's always a good way to negotiate a solution and listening is a key component of that. Um, I've been lucky to be a problem solver and a negotiator and I think those are skills that I'll bring to the dais and to city council when I'm elected and I think I'm very well qualified for this role in dealing with the circumstances that you encounter with passionate, excited people who believe in what they're, they're talking about and what their concerns are. Thank you. <laughs> okay, before we get to the, uh, to the final round of um, candidate closing statements, we've got uh, five what I'll call speed round questions. I'm gonna ask uh, Jonathan to sit these out because these are, these are questions uh, designed to kind of gauge your knowledge and how much homework you've done about the city. And these questions will be one minute apiece. So we'll start with Mr. Konishak, how many city council meetings have you attended in the past year? Did you stay through the entire meeting? And for a one vote bonus in the election, can you tell us who Mrs. Miller is? <laughs> I've, been to, I've been to 10 city council meetings. Um, what's the other question? Did you stay through the whole thing? Yeah, every single one. Fun, isn't it? Oh, Can yeah. you tell us who Mrs. Miller is? 
Um, I'm not, not familiar with Mrs. Miller. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. No vote for you. Moving on down. I think it was two to three, or, um, but, um, and I've stayed through the whole things, and, um, and I can't say who Mrs. Miller is. Um, I've, been to six to, I've been to six to eight meetings. Um, my schedule is very demanding. Um, I have to make sure that I'm running my businesses all the time. I do try to watch them on the, online as much as I can. Um, I, I have stayed for the majority of them. I think two ago I didn't stay the whole time. Um, and if we're talking about Ms. Miller, is that Faye? Is that, I don't know. I, I don't remember the last name when she introduced herself. I just remember the first name. I'm sorry. <laughs> so this, is, this is Faye right down here. Right, no, I met Faye today. I just was like, I think the last name starts with an M. I'm not sure. But um, no, she, I do not know. She's a troublemaker too, but I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how many meetings I've been to. I've been to several meetings. Um, Depending on what the issue is, I've watched uh, all two years uh, that I have not been on the council, all the meetings. Uh, I thought that it would be a cheap promotion to go to the city council meetings now that I'm running. Um, I don't want it because any position that I would take, it's almost as if I'm challenging the city council and disrupting. Uh, so I chose to, to not do that unless it's like a real important issue. Um, Miss Miller starts with her first name is like A. Dot Miss Miller. Uh, she wears cool hats. I will say that if we talk about the same person, um, putting aside politics, um, I, I think that she is one of the best speakers, passionately wise, um, I have ever heard. And regardless of whether what elements you agree or disagree with, uh, someone to have courage to come up and speak about their position, I think it should be commendable and not made fun of. Thank you. Even though I'm running for city council, I feel it's very important and not a self-promoting activity to attend city council meetings. So I've con continued to attend after announcing my campaign. I think each city council meeting gives you an absolute eye view, bird's eye view, as well as a micro level view of what's going on, how city council makes decisions, and it's critical to always be informed if you're planning a candidacy and planning on sitting up there. Um, I have been to, I, I would say, probably 18 of the 20 some. I have sat through them in their entirety, and during the last two and a half years, I've, I've been to an equal uh, number each year. Um, Ms. Miller is a passionate individual. She is also known as Madam Butterfly, and she believes in some of her presentations very strongly, um, and I do know who she is. I have uh, attended eight to ten meetings uh, in the past year, uh, stayed through the entirety for most of them. Uh, particular ones I stayed for were ones that had to do with uh, possible reversal of decisions by the Planning Commission. As a civil, civil engineer, those were kind of more right up my alley, so I was really specifically watching those. Uh, and as a um, civil engineer on development projects, I have very well aware of Ms. Miller, not only in the city of Murrieta, but in uh, District Board of Supervisors. Uh, I've witnessed her there. She is very anti-growth. In fact, no growth whatsoever. And uh, as was said, she's very passionate about what she believes. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Mr. Knight. Can you describe Murrieta's city council, city manager form of government? Well, the city manager form of government is the council sets policies for the city manager to implement. So the, the main employee, um, I think that the city, the city council has two employees that, that they dictate um, policy to, and then, um, and then the manager then um, sets that policy into action. Is that sufficient? Sure. Um, our city manager, Kim Summers, is great. Um, I've got to meet with her a couple times, and 
uh, the way it works is that uh, we get to we get to work with her and she gets to delegate all of that information that we want to the staff and the staff works hard to give us answers and it runs through Kim and she brings it to us. So I think that it's a really good way to run this government so we don't have, the burden isn't between five people to get this information and make sure it's proper. We have uh, someone that's highly qualified. Um, you know, Kim is very highly qualified so it's, it's a great person to have um, in the middle. Well, it, pretty much what was said, um, uh, the city council sets the policy and the city manager's job is to um, take that policy and implement the policy. Uh, we do only have two employees, uh, city attorney and uh, the city manager. Um, it's really, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. There's really not much to elaborate on. Thank you. Ms. White. The city manager is our CEO. Oh, <clears throat> the city manager is our CEO. The city council establishes policies and sets direction. The city manager enacts that in dealing with staff and carries out the goals that are set for the city manager and the city staff. Thank you. This form of government, uh, the council provides legislative and policy direction uh, for the city manager to implement. Uh, we work directly with the city manager and with the city attorney, and from there, they filter it to uh, their staff uh, to be able to implement uh, those policies and, and those legislative decisions. Uh, the city council sets policies and direction, and the city manager, Kim Summers, sets policies into action. You guys are lucky. The first person knows this, and everybody else just tags on. That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> so these are easy questions, aren't they? So we'll start the next one with uh, Mr. Haggerty. Can you tell us what the current city budget is, and where does that money come from? Currently, our budget's around $90 million. Um, they come from, it comes from sales tax, it comes from property tax, it comes from, um, you know, it's pretty much it, honestly. We have a general fund that we uh, go through the police department. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple, so. Um. Okay, so we'll say about $90 million is the budget. Um, uh, the revenues that's generated from the city uh, is in forms of taxes, uh, sales tax, property tax, uh, our uh, meager piece from uh, gas tax, uh, fees that are associated with the city, um, development fees, um, uh, your dip fees, you also have, uh, it's mostly just taxes and fees that you generate money from. You do get some grants in from other agencies uh, that come into it. I wish I had something compelling to add that's gonna be missed, but I can't think of anything that is like a gotcha moment. I'm gonna use this 10 seconds to think though. That's pretty much it, thank you. Yes, our city budget is 89 to 90 million. We raise revenues from sales tax, property taxes, developer impact fees, special assessments. Right now we're working with grants in the community service division and department. Without some of the grant money that our parks and recreation um, manager finds, we would be hard pressed to keep up with what the demands are of replacing infrastructure and equipment in, in our city parks. And Leah Kolick is our um, head of community services. She does a fabulous job with grants. And we're also working currently with the community development block grants. Um, money is given from the federal to the state to the county of Riverside, and then individual municipalities deal with dispersing that. Um, and we're in the process of assembling. Um, our ad hoc committee is uh, assembled, 
and are going to be making some uh, reviews and then council will decide where the CDBG monies go. Yes, the, the city budget is $89.1 million uh, for the city. Uh, the budget is a two-year process, and um, for this process, it's 89.1. Uh, we do get fees, revenues from property taxes and sales tax, Deve development inf impact fees, grants, uh, as well as their specific funds. For instance, the fire fund goes directly to fire, library for the library, and even though they're not exactly um, part of the city's uh, funding, we do oversee it as a city council. Our budget is $89.1 million, and our revenue comes from taxes, which includes sales tax, property tax, grants from other agencies, and so on. I would agree with all the other answers. I think that um, yeah, our budget's around $90 million and, they co and the, the budget is raised from taxes and fees. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat what the others um, have just said. Okay. Next question, do you agree? We'll start with Mr. Ramos on this one. Do you agree with the six city council goals? Should more be added or current ones changed? So I, I do agree with the direction of the city, um, which makes it really challenging uh, when you're trying to ask for, to get on the council. Uh, I believe Marietta is a wonderful city. It's one of the reasons why I chose to, to make this my permanent home after my time in the Marine Corps. Um, I, 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 for, to add to the goals, I think that we need to at the very least, become a gigabit city, um, at the very least. Um, I, I think we need to, if we're still trying to uh, attract um, um, some high-tech businesses, we need to have the infrastructure in place. And that, that's, that's an easy thing to, 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 to bring to the city. There are a lot of cities that are in the middle of nowhere that have gigabit speeds. Um, so I, I, I like technology, and I, I would try to reach for that. I do agree with these goals that were set forth by the current city council. They're to provide a high level of innovative public safety service to the community, aggressively pursue economic development, assure fiscal responsibility, plan, program, create infrastructure development, coordinate and deliver responsive, effective community services, and finally, to foster and promote a connected, caring community. I think these are well-founded. I could support them. I would not have at this time when I'm elected another goal to implement. I think these are a foundational cornerstone of the decision-making that the council does, and I think the goals are great. As Ms. White said, uh, the six goals are to aggressively pursue economic development, provide a high level of innovative public service to the community, assure fiscal responsibility, plan, program, and create infrastructure development, coordinate and develop responsive, effective community services, foster and promote a connected and caring community. One thing that is stated in their goals is that that is contingent on a balanced budget. So that's one thing that I completely agree with these goals, but that is the key to making those goals go forward is to make sure that the budget is balanced. I agree with the city council goals, but there's always room for improvement. My personal goals for the city will be public safety, economic development, and better infrastructure. I agree with the, the, um, the current city council's goals. I, I also agree um, specifically um, I'm in favor of the incubator project, um, the innovation center that's trying to attract anchor tenants who are going to, um, who are then going to also um, spawn other businesses that are going to uh, thrive in our community. Once again, I'm gonna go back to the ultra broadband. I think investing in our infrastructure technology is very important. Um, it's the future, it's not going anywhere. 
the more technology that's here, the more big companies can, will come, and the more big companies that come might, can attract um, higher level people. Those people can help with response times can, with, as far as technology goes. Like, we can just bring in so much with that. Uh, Ramos was talking about Gigabyte. It's just it's very simple. We have high-speed internet here. We attract higher businesses. What I want to also do is bring a university here because if a university here is, is here, we can expand so much more as far as bringing international, um, uh, you know, minds. You know, people, people are going to be attracted to come here nationally and internationally. We can do studies for our area a lot easier. There's just so many benefits to um, looking, for, or looking towards a university and bringing ultra broadband to Marietta. Last question, <clears throat> and we'll start with Ms. White. Can you describe the elements that make up the city's general plan, and how frequently is that plan updated? There are, <laughs> there are eight elements that are mandated by the state of California. Those are the land use element, the economic development element, the circulation, infrastructure, healthy community, conservation, recreation and open space, air quality, and noise element. There are also some additional ones that the city council has enacted. Those are a climate action plan that deals with greenhouse emissions, um, the housing element, and the implementation plan, um, as well as safety. And I, these are These were adopted in 2011. I'm not sure how often they are. Oh, I'm not sure to the second part of the question. Okay, what I'm, what I'm actually gonna do is, <clears throat> is call a halt to it here because I assume that the rest of you either know them or have been making notes right and left while she's reading them <clears throat> off there. So, I, <laughs> yeah. And I so, covered it, I covered it well, so. <laughs> um, so at this, at this time, we will get to the, uh, to the candidate's closing statements, and we will start in reverse order. You have one minute for a candidate closing statement. We will start with Mr. Ramos, remembering that this is your last opportunity to convince these fine folks who came out and spent the evening with you that you are the right person for the job. Mr. Ramos. Okay. Um, first, uh, just to add, I think the specific plan is updated every five years. Okay, I want to first thank everyone for coming out and listening. I believe over the last two forums, clear distinctions have been made on positions and insight on how we would likely vote in the future. Based on this newfound information, I hope you all will consider voting for me on November 6. As a Marine and a Christian, I strongly believe in the Marine Corps' core values, honor, courage, and commitment. In the last meeting, one of the questions involved integrity an extremely relevant question as it does not evolve or sentiments like the ends justify the means hold any effect on it. Something as simple as sign placement can be telling. If you're willing to bend the rules now, you are likely willing to bend the rules in office. For example, if you place your signs at medians or utility posts, those are against the rules. You are bending the law. Integrity is an important quality for your representative on the council. Another example, the city is breaking the law and using taxpayer dollars to promote a measure. Most have received the propaganda pamphlets in the mail. If you have not, you can actually go to City Hall and pick up a copy. There are also posters on Mr. our- Mr. Ramos, board. I'm sorry, your time's up. Every, everybody has a minute. Sorry. God bless and drive safe. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming down. Um, this is really important for the city, um, for everyone to see this. Um, one thing that I grew up was with Southern values. My, I, my, mother of, my stepmother of 18 years is from Louisiana, and we used to go there every summer. So a lot of my values have come from that, um, learning how to be polite and to be nice and to understand people. And that's one big thing that I'm gonna be bringing to this, uh, along with my business sense. Um, uh, it's very hard to, to make hard decisions, obviously, and I'm prepared to do that, um, to make cuts where we need to, to do the things we have to, to to be the true future of Southern California. So if you vote for me, um, I'm saying this now, I haven't stated this publicly yet, um, but if I am elected, I am stepping away from my business to dedicate all my time to this um, because I, this is very important to me and I wanna be, uh, dedicate the rest of my life to public service. 
It has been a pleasure um, participating in these forums and, and speaking about my views. Um, I've appreciated the challenging questions and how we as a city are going to focus on facing the challenges that, um, that we face and ensure the qual our quality of life is preserved and improved. And really that is why I am running for city council. I believe that my legal background and my, my love for our community um, and desire to make Murrieta a place um, that everyone wants to live and work really um, uh, enables me to represent um, District 2 and the city of Murrieta. Um, we all moved here for a high quality of life and we want it to remain so. And I would appreciate your vote this November uh, and would be honored to represent District 2 and Marietta. Thank you. I love the city of Marietta, but there's always room for improvement. If you elect me, I will improve our public safety, our economic development, and our infrastructure. I want to apply the success I've had in the real estate business to our city. And I hope you write me in for District 5. Thank you everybody for coming out and listening to us give our opinions and on the subjects that matter most to the city of Murrieta. Uh, I've been a civil engineer for 28 years and a Murrieta resident for 16 years. I think with uh, being a civil engineer that gives me kind of a unique perspective uh, that the current council does not have on some of the development issues that we have that face the city. Um, you will know where I stand, I, but I am completely approachable. I have convictions, and you'll know where I stand, as I said, um, but I'm certainly willing to listen to people and hear what they have to say. Uh, I pride myself in integrity, transparency, and accountability, and that's how I'll act if I'm on the dais. Thank you. I think my commission, city commissioner experience will really help me be a great city councilwoman for Murrieta. I think I will bring a fresh perspective as a woman to the city council and another point of view that should be valued and will contribute. I love the city of Murrieta. I've passed extensive background checks in my past, so my level of security clearance is very high. I bring a high level of integrity, tenacity, accountability, approachability, and really look forward to serving. I have no ambitions politically. I'm really interested in working for the city of Marietta to continue the 27 years of work that's been done and to build a city that reflects the values of our people and that we'll be able to use going forward for the next 27 years. This has been an honor to serve as a council member for the city of Marietta, and if I'm honored to have your vote again for another four-year term, it would be an honor to serve. <clears throat> we live in a great city. We don't need to make our city great. All we have to do is figure out how to protect it and make sure that we keep moving forward for generations to come. So again, I would appreciate your vote. Thank you very much. I think the city of, uh, of Murrieta is well served by having seven such uh, folks of great integrity, intelligence, discipline, who are willing to step up and volunteer to work with you for the next four years of their lives. It's not an easy job, and uh, I think we should give them a round of applause for coming out. <clears throat> The Alltech Media Group, a full-service video production, advertising, and marketing company. For over three decades, we've been providing successful strategic ideas and media tools to small businesses, manufacturers, and government agencies. The Alltech Media Group is a one-source marketing solution, from videos and print to digital and social media for the manufacturing industry. Compare the difference in our customer service the difference in our creativity, and the difference in our quality of work. For a free marketing evaluation, contact us today.